and yeah let me start the thing what's up guys um this is chris bromley here with unfun stuff we're going to be going through all of the uh south town summer showdowns is that the name of the thing it was a, it was a lot of s's very alliterative uh top eight decks um you know like i could go through like a deck review of like my stuff we can go through all the cards in my deck but like people have seen my deck for the past year everybody knows how akuma works it knows how raptor works there are a couple of new decks you know there was some cool stuff that people haven't really been seeing which is just neat to see like the janet and the um people haven't seen when before um if they weren't me <laughs> playing into jose every week uh but like knowing what the what the ins and outs of matchups look like how i would you know construct to beat decks because I, I wasn't very surprised by anything that i saw apart from the akuma i didn't think that i would see akuma in this format especially not the bad checks one but um and go figure that's what i lost to you in top eight but i think that every one of these decks is is prepared for and has shared options so we're going to talk about the decks themselves the cards in them of course some of the things that i think maybe were weird about them some things that make them different i have some notes of course took about it um but uh yeah let's get into it we're gonna start from the bottom go to the top because uh i sucked and i was eight after a uh, switch champing switch champ curse got me oh man this music is getting is too loud for me also the song sucks we'll do lo-fi go to the lo-fi radio Copyright free, by the way. Gonna need me to resleeve my deck again? Oh yeah, dude. They, I, the, the judges did have to resleeve my seventy-eight card deck, by the way. So this is Yoshi. This is my Yoshi. I've been playing it for all, almost a year now. Like after Worlds, we were fucking around with Bison Two from the DLCs because we thought that a mill deck would be really funny, and he certainly can mill. Um, but surviving is a thing. So we had like Princess Parries in it but you know we were just putting a thousand checks in the deck and trying to fail them so we could respond and remove the top card of the deck and like shortly after that kevin broberg who was on my team last year or i was on his team this is a broberg show at that point um broberg played this crazy yoshimitsu deck um for our team and in singles where he was just like using evil bow and manji to just get whatever he needed out of the yard it was very cool very broberg um but we had like shadow slices at that time it was, it was a lot more aggressive. He was using Kali Yugas, and he was just trying to shove a thousand meteors and and, and shadow slices up your butt hole. Um, and it was it was effective. I, I don't know if he topped, um, but I remember the deck being just really, really cool and fun. And at some point, he said, why don't you just take this Bison package, because it's very similar to the Yoshi package. I was using Manji Evil Bows in it, and just play Mill Yoshi. And I was like, that's funny. And if we go into uh, my saved objects and type Yoshi in, uh, you can see how many iterations of Yoshi I've made over the past year. These are all like separate ones. Like I have a bunch of different ones, but like I made it for retro. I mean, I've just made a lot of Yoshi. I think he's a very cool character. Um, and uh, it's just it's just big cool, man. He's a very very cool character, and uh, I've learned something every time I've played the deck, which is which is always fun. Uh, number one uh, choices in the deck are just you know Shokan Prince keeps you alive uh it discourages those seven handers that are playing greedy ass strings from from attacking you with big strings manji and evil bow uh are, are are kind of like the the nuts and bolts of the deck it gives you whatever you need you want if you've looked at my career in ufs i really hate raw drawing because i have terrible rng personally uh i played fey and i could pick up sand grenade from the discard pile uh, i played kwan and we have four napalm man we could pick up all, anything we wanted from our discard pile we're playing yoshi mitsu we want to pick up whatever we want for our discard pile. It's uh, it's just my thing. I love tutoring. Uh, I really dislike raw drawing. I don't like relying on RNG on like my math to get there because I don't do math. I'm a musician, uh, and I wanna I wanna you know I wanna be in control of my game state. Um, it, it makes it so that the decks are a lot harder to play. This is probably the most complex deck I've ever played in my entire life in any game. Um, uh, which is why I think people shy away from playing it. It just it just like has this this association of slow play or something like that. But uh, because if they play it, they'd slow play. But I play very very fast. I very rarely would go to time um, on on my own merits as my opponent's taking a long time to to do their things. Um, but strings typically we're trying to bait people into using their their flips 
um, so that I can eventually from science. I debated, I, I went between Palindrome and this copy of Betrayer of Twelve. Um, I used to have two copies of Betrayer of Twelve, but those one was a little bit of a slower deck. The format's very, very fast right now. So having one of is fine. It's got a good low, a good, a good block and everything like that. And if I get it out and I've slowed them down enough, I can eventually Fatality, you know, force them to either block and lose a card of their hand, or they don't block and I respond with Betrayer of Twelve to make them flip a foundation so that eventually I can just, like, hit double reduction into from science with love. Um... The other thing I swapped from the, the Tim Kef Keefe event was I added in a Rando Spirit Gun instead of the uh, I Shall Save Humanity. I think I Shall Save Humanity is a lot more fun, but Rando Gun certainly kills people, and it makes it so you can make your giant greedy strings. Uh, Yoshimitsu, you can see the deck is basically just five diffs. It's like Evil Bow, the only four difficulty attack is Evil Bow, and one of Hell Vortex, which Hell Vortex is something I can loop every turn if I want to be doing fatality things. Or if I want to be mill actually milling them. It also is a good poke. Like, it's just three high six. And, like, a lot of times people just take the six. Um, but they're all three diffs. Or five diffs. So, and they're usually being played after reduction. So my strings are very, very difficult. It takes me a long time to get to the point where I, where I I'm feel comfortable attacking them. Um, but once I do, it's it's almost always a, a complete kill. Uh, except for, like, one situation today. Anytime I went and I killed somebody, um, Jason got me with a demon hide that made it so my science couldn't kill him. Um, but highlights of the deck for me um, are just the, ver the versatility of the sideboard. Our game one matchup is really just trying to like figure out what their deck does so I can fine tune what I'm doing in the second and third games if I need to. Uh, a lot of the one ofs are two ofs actually when I go into the second game. Um, the most important card for this meta environment, uh, I know that Cassandra didn't show up at this at this event, but Hacker Extraordinaire, I keep a three of with a one of in the sideboard. You need to see Hacker Extraordinaire against Cassandra or you will not beat it. Um, you need to pressure her assets or you will not beat it. Um, I, I also, I learned from my matchup against Church, who just ripped apart my staging area with Judgment Days and things like that. I just didn't hit my, I had two hackers main and one cyber in that one, and I was like, no, nah, I'm going back to three main, one side, because the Cassandra matchup really needs the hackers, um, be, because that matchup is very dependent on that. If you can, if you can keep her below two, two assets the entire game, she loses. She cannot beat you if you just keep flipping her assets. And when you're flipping her assets, you force her into deadlock, you make it so you're from, five, from Science of Loves, come in at just Gigantor. Uh, uh, you know, you get like multiple sixes and things like that. Um, and, and yeah, it's just really, really good. Uh, some of the other things in the deck that are, that were key, like openers, I discovered way of the true warrior at the end of last year, just, uh, well, not discovered, but like I put it in the deck cause I was like, you know, reverberate is really killing me. Um, so are things like throws. It's just, it just answers a lot of things. Um, when I played against miles, I removed combo from one of his attacks. So he couldn't yin and yang me on my turn. And that was super clutch, uh, loyal friend gigantic card i can't believe that i've never played it before and by i can't believe it i mean uh we didn't have black bear diner before so it sucked but this card in combination or conjunction with scarlet meteor and black bear diner really really just rips apart your opponent's staging area there's very few things that say you can't seal my stuff so I, every time i played into jose's when i was like how do i kill him through Sha uh, shallon fighters and you're just like oh well i build in a, a loyal friend with a uh, scarlet meteor i seal his big thing a black bear diner it um, I seal his second best thing, and then on the next attack, or, and then I, and then I, uh, Black Bear Diner it, so the next attack I get to seal another thing. So it's just really, really good. Black Bear Diner, of course, is actually, like, people are going to complain about Manji and Evil Bow, but Black Bear Diner is actually the best card in the deck. It lets me reuse all my good resources, it lets me, uh, it lets me unflip the things that they flip, because everybody's flipping Shokan Prince, you're just like, oh, they flip it? Okay, I'll bring it right back with, with Black Bear Diner, sucks to suck, nerd. Um, you, you flip Hellfire of Despair, reuse it again, so you're only taking, uh, printed from, like, shotgun decks, you, uh, you flip commit way of true warrior unflip it for, so that their next attack also doesn't have the throw keyword or something like that you can reuse solomon's teachings it's just a really bonkers card for for these wall decks that are having these that these should be one-time use things um so it's 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 just a lot it's, it completes the package well which is why we're playing three copies of it um uh I don't know. There's a whole lot I would change about the list. I think I performed really, really well on the day. Um, it's just sometimes Akuma kills you. Just the thing that happens. Um, yeah, Cassandra does not have stuff to get her out of deadlock. That's absolutely true. But if you cannot deal with Manji slash Evil Bow, you have to break the wall. Um, you have to break the wall, and it's super difficult. Um, if you have big multiples, if you have board wipes, like Dragon's Tongue... You know, it makes him, you know, it, getting rid of Manji is really important. Uh, my third game against the Akuma, I hit all three of my Evil Bell early before I had a Manji in my discard pile, so I had no way to loop them. And I would, and I couldn't, I didn't draw a Manji until my second cycle. So I was, I was really delayed because of my RNG in that game. I just, I, I didn't get the thing that I want to do, which is, which is control what I have in my hand. I had to rely on my static draws. And so that was a little bit unfortunate. Um, 
But, you know, controlling assets, if you can control Black Bear Diner, you can control my unflipping, and that's really, really powerful. Don't use your flip enhances against this deck. Don't do it. When I played against Akuma, when I played against um, Elena, I was, I was like, just, I was like, hey, man, I'm going to do this thing that you could respond to to flip your thing. And... And it's not because I want, like, if I get what I'm what I'm poking with, whatever it is, like I'm using Fatality into an uh, 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 Orphan Alchemist deck or something like that, most of the time I don't, I didn't even look at the discard pile. I was just like, hey, I'm responding with Fatality. You want to flip that thing? And they're like, yeah, I'll draw a card. And I'm like, yeah, I'll take multiple one, an extra multiple on my From Science with Love. So just don't flip your, your cards into this deck. Don't flip them. Don't do it. If I, if I, that's an easy kill. Without the From Science kill, I have to assemble a real ass string that usually involves multiple meteors and multiple spirit guns. And that takes quite a while to assemble. So in in the meantime, if you're not flipping your foundations, um, you can you can pressure a little bit better um, and find your answers to to the board. Um, if you don't have insane deadlock ability, abilities, do not go into deadlock. Do not go into deadlock against this deck because uh, once I get Daughter of the Bladed Rod on board, um, your your staging area is no longer a staging area. So you're eventually going to get to the point where you just have like I have 15 foundations, but none of them are relevant because Daughter of the Bladed Rod curated my staging area, made all the best things go away. And nothing interacts with Daughter of the Blade of Rod except for the Andy Foundation. Um, so it's really nuts. I guess Pursuing a Vendetta does too. That's fair. Um, if you have cancels like Orphaned Alchemist, uh, save it for Koenmas. Um, same with Protecting the Protector. Always have a momentum for Koenmas because um, that's the like the high roll uh, of the deck is hitting early Koenmas. And if you have a, uh, Orphan Alchemist and you respond with your one copy of it to Fatality, boy, howdy, do I love that. That means I get to coin you twice. So it's very, very good. Um, as for the cyborg I was talking about, again, I just put, put more throw hate in because uh, I have trouble with, with Cassandra throws and, like, and when. When when is, I think, actually my toughest matchup. Um, uh, Jose just knows my deck really well. I know his deck really well. So if he pogs out, I, I just wanted to put more throw hate in. Um, the sideboard, uh, Hellfire De Despair is really, really good. These are all just one ofs, except for Guardian Slasher and Demon Hide. There's just one ofs in the deck that I can tool up to be plus one because the the benefit to running a mill deck with 78 cards, mill deck with 78 cards, is that you have all these options, but you might not hit them. You know, you might not hit them. So, so we're just like trying to buff up our, our RNG a little bit in the second and third games by just saying, oh, we're into Raptor. I'll add another TK Mastery. Oh, I'm into Cassandra. I need a fourth hacker. Oh, I'm into Sungmina. I want to add another Living Pendulum. Or like, you know, Wave of True Warrior into a Reverberate deck. Or Solomon's Teaching into a Speed deck. It's just stuff like that. Um, and a lot of times we're actually adding in a whole bunch and like taking out some of our spam and things like that. Or I'm taking out assets. Like a lot of times Fiddle Sticks came out. A lot of times Soul Calibur came out. Or maybe the Koemas or the Shokan Princess against Five Handers. Um, and these just shore up those things. There's a lot of cards that are not very good in the different matters that are good like that. But, but really good deck. Um, very tough to deal with if you don't have extreme early pressure. If you have extreme early pressure and extreme scaling in the late game, like uh, Cassandra's good at it. Um, but the matchup of Cassandra is very volatile. If she controls my board early, I can't come back. But if I get to pull out hackers, she does not get to play the game. Um, so it's just it's just a very, very strong deck. Very, very good. Uh, um play with your friends and then complain about how hard it is to play because it's an incredibly complex deck it's not easy to play um yeah let's go on to the next one i suppose south town who is seventh the janet oops so andrew is a pretty new player i think as well as as kevin shelton these are guys that are uh i think out of Alabama. Um, so Andrew messaged me a couple weeks ago. I've been talking on and off with him for a little bit. I've been sending him deck lists and stuff like that. And he was like, hey, man, I heard you have some Janet stuff. So I just sent him all my Janets. I sent him some of my all lists. I sent him my void list. I sent him my burn list. Um, and and uh, he didn't say anything. He was he was just like, oh, these are cool. And then he showed up to this event with, the, with, with this Wrath of the Raging Demon deck. He made a lot of changes. There's some things I don't play in this deck. Um... Uh, but it's it's a really cool idea. If you're not like looking at it, and you're like I can't, I don't get it. He only has four real attacks. It's Janet starts with a spell circle, and you play Fatality and get your second momentum, or maybe your Lord Rector's clutches there to get another momentum, and then you play Noob into Raging Demon, and that one shots any character. Uh, two of these Noobs plus a Wrath of the Raging Demon is 36 damage, and if you have two Shell of a Proud Man, you killed Goro. It is disgusting. Uh, it's very, very good. If you let this deck get to turn four, it kills you. Um, 
So the way to beat this deck is early aggression. Early aggression and board pressure. If you can get four or five momentum, you will not die to this deck. If you can get, sorry, if you get to, like, if you if you just build for three turns, you're probably going to lose. Um, so it's, it's just, you got to apply really early pressure. Janet has trouble dealing with early pressure. Um, she's got very fake defense. There are some really nasty combos. He has, like, Beast Hunter and Janet is fucked up. Because uh, she says that you can't play that attack ever again after she responds with her foundation. Um, but there's some things he's not running main board. Like, he sideboarded the Quan Chi's Fortresses. He sideboarded the Blood, Sweat, and Beers. He sideboarded the Deliverances. So those, those aren't coming in until turn two. Like, I would have played a copy of Guardian's Final Duty main board, probably. Um, and I would have played a, a copy of Quan Chi's Fortress early. Um, the other thing is that this deck takes serious cojones to play. Um, because it loses to certain matchups very, very easily. Um, if you're running Pure Heart, his Data Dog Voice of Reason thing is just trolling. Because um, even if he does it during a fatality, you just discard the Pure Heart and rip up his board. Like, you get rid of Shell of Proud Man plus his Raptor's Clutches, and he's never, never coming back from that. You know, like, it, it's just, it's just, it's rough. So he has to play smart around those Pure Heart matchups. Um, so fatality is not the main win condition. No, it's, it's, the fatalities are in there just to get momentum because so so wrath of the raging demon requires you to have two momentum and have the evil symbol and your opponent has to have zero momentum so you have to answer three questions one is you need to say my character has to have evil right easy you know we got janet she's got evil second is how do i get two momentum consistently enough that this is worth running as my primary win condition and the answer is well janet always has one momentum fatality is another momentum things like raptors clutches do both of what i need to do it discards their momentum and gets me one like it's good. Void Symbol actually has like this deck, this really interesting deck. Um, and and sorry, the third thing I didn't mention. The third thing is that you need to prevent them from having momentum. So you have things like we are many, we are you are but one. I ran like three copies of that in my main board because it's a two mid block three six, and I really want to prevent them from having momentum. Uh, you have uh, he's playing Data Dog plus Voice of Reason. Like this little combo here, that's why he's running four Voice of Reason, just so he can scout with Janet and then go draw that card. Right, so that's the one thing that she does really well. It's just scary. Like I'm scared of Voice of Reason in this format because of Pure of Heart and all the water decks. But this combo between Data Dog and Voice of Reason means that he can, you know, build one Voice of Reason and two Data Dogs, and he's discarding one momentum off of one enhance or two momentum off of one enhance. So it's it's pretty brutal. Um, and and so then he also has Power Made Flesh, which discards some momentum. Nobody's ever played this card because it's a zero four with no block. But this card needs it. It needs to discard your momentum so that it can Wrath of the Raging Demon and make it unblockable. Um, and otherwise, it's very, very cool. Uh, Raptor's Clutches, I have quite literally never done it on a reversal. Um, uh, it's actually only in there because it discards one of their momentum and gives you a momentum. Uh, like, And that's worth it in this deck, even though it's a 3-4 non-block. But you can't reversal the unblockable attack, and you can't reversal Fatality. If she's going in, she's going to just be, uh, be killing you. Um... So, so like, Fusion of Souls just gives you a, a, a noob, and you have to, it, it, it gets back that hand size because you probably had to discard a, a card from your hand to get the spell circle. Azul's little dog, doll is really important because people are mainboarding things like the Deliverance, they're, you know, taking things that could cancel your, your wrath. I actually, woo! <laughs> Thanks for the, uh, whatever that was. Somebody followed. Why is it doing that? I want it to be the, damn, that sucks. I gotta fix that later. Um... It just cancels responses, and that's really important. Um, Conquest of Terror, I wouldn't play it for of. I mean, I guess it's a low block. Uh, I think that card is overvalued. Thanks for the sub, man. Um, Voice of Reason, again, I, I, see, I see from... But the really important players here, offensively, are... Uh... Yeah, I'll allow that's fine. Um, Shell of a Proud Man gets you to the awkward numbers, because one noob plus one wrath is 24 damage. Sometimes you need, like, 27 or 28. So you can, like, poke with a fatality, respond with shells to, to get that extra two or four damage that you needed. <coughs> and um, and kill a six-hander with just one wrath plus one raging demon. So it's pretty good. Pretty neat. Um, pretty cool. It's a neat deck. Uh, it, requires, uh, it requires some serious edge line play um, because it has one win condition. There's actually just win one win condition in the deck, and it's just Wrath. So you have to see Wrath. You have to be able to control their momentum. Um, and so the way you would deal with this is you play around Beast Hunter, if they have it. That's just the thing you got to deal with. Um, 
you got to aggress them early because Janet doesn't like it when you're aggressing her early. Um, don't get trapped by it. But the thing is that they have to draw the cards. And if she has four if she has four foundations, she's probably not doing it to you. So you can just play out your hand early game cuz she's she she like it's like okay, what's the worst she can do? She she drew two um she drew two wrath. It does also hard lose to opposite to opposing Janet. That's why we got to run surprise reunion, dude. Or the what's the seeking allies the three the three five and uh thing that, that you have to remove a uh, three to foundation um yeah it's got some really really tough matchups um but if you pair well and you play well it can it can really get you there uh it's a cool deck so you know so just aggress early um disrespect its offense early honestly that's what i would do you know hold a mid block because that's all you need if you have momentum and yeah pretty good protecting Akina, another great card in this deck this is really cool. I definitely would recommend, if I were to play this deck elsewise, I would have played way more Hacker. Like, three three Hacker. I mean, you just guys saw my deck. Would play three Hacker. And I don't like the Voice of Reason Data Dog thing. Um, next one up was... The When? I think it's When Time. It's When Time. So this is a really interesting deck. Um, a lot of you haven't seen one, so we'll read what he does. He's got a form and a response with air, earth, and evil, which is an interesting combination of symbols. Air and earth are not, you know, they're supposed to be opposite, right? But the form lets him, once per turn, ready all of his cards in the staging area, which includes the character, okay? If he has three or fewer characters, it ends his combat phase. Well, then why does he say once per turn? Well, if he has four of them... His, the opponent commits all of their foundations. So he readies everything, and the opponent commits all of their foundations. He stuns you out completely. It's an ass-beating, dude. It's so nuts. Um, the response um, gives them minus to their check. He commits himself to do it, of course. Any check, okay? Which is funny, because sometimes Jose will, will respond to prevent me from manjing or something like that. It's really funny. And then, uh, But it equals X plus 1 where X is the number of characters um, in his staging area. So this is just hard gauge deck, right? And what do you do when you have a hard gauge deck? You play every gauge throw. Luckily, he's got a gauge throw. He's got this murder fire, which says that he has, if he has less than, if he has a smaller printed hand size than you, it gets throw. Pretty bad into Yoshi, but you know, we take those. Um, lightning torture, ass beating in this deck because it's Gigantor. Um, lightning shot, another gauge attack, and it's just stun because sometimes they'll have sense of morals and you need to over stun them a little bit afterwards. Um, and candidate. An interesting note about Jose's list is I didn't realize he didn't run a single three of because he's just trying to get, he's like, these are the cards I really need and these are the cards I might need. There's no like in between. What's gauge again? Okay, so gauge is normally you would have to play a character, right? He's got four characters in his deck. If you get gauge off, it's gauge, uh, semicolon number. If you do damage equal to or greater than the number on the gauge rating when you after you activate gauge, you go search your deck and discard pile and add a character from the either of those zones to your staging area. So it just auto-builds a character. So in an ideal situation, what'll happen is Jose will, will start with a win. He'll play a win into a state into his into his card pool on a five. He'll play murder fire on a five. Gauge, because it's gauge three and he's got tons of damage buff, buffs for it. Then he'll play Lightning Shot on a 6. You know, maybe he'll tap 2 or something like that. Tap 1 for that. He'll give it 3 damage. Because he just gauged. Right? He got one of those characters. And that gives him the last character. And then, end of turn, he's got 4, four wins. It's really gross. Um, and he can... he's he's Whenever he gets that turn 2 combo off, it it's like almost impossible for me to win. I've beaten him one time, and it was at the tournament when he when he pogged out and got, got turn 2 win. Um, but the offense is pretty simple to figure out. Um, he's just got, you know, the the uh, the wet your whistle stuff, the big throws, um, lightning shot, then cannonade is like the ass beater because this is coming in for thirteen, you know, um, when he's stacked and it goes picks up goes and picks up other cannonades, right? This is a real five hander, right? He he doesn't have any way to loop things or draw more cards, so cannonade answers the question, which is what do I do after I've committed them out? Well, I play cannonade. It's unblockable because of my response. I'm giving them minus five to their check and they're completely tapped out so they can't block it. It's for 13. I pick up a second one. Uh, I ready my face. Hey, there you go. 26 damage out of your butthole. And that's just on itself, right? Not not accounting for things like massive size 
not accounting for things like uh, energy absorption, which are also giving him tons and tons of damage. Um, it's just really good. And then defensively, because he's a five-hander and can't block very well, almost all of the, the offense also flexes defensively. It's hard to play a big string into a character that gives you minus to your check. Just at static, it's minus two. If he gets one stack, it's minus three, and so on and so forth. So it's hard to string him just at, just by itself. Um, but Shallon Fighter is nuts. His throws become minus four damage while he's in Desperation. And Desperation starts at 17 life. So, yeah. Um, Redeem Rogue, all of these cards are ranged. All of them, except for Fuma. They're all ranged. So his entire discard pile is just minus two damage. It's nuts. It's very good. Second Saintly Beast, very good. And you know what adds insult to injury? is when he energy absorptions twice on your five damage attack. It deals one, he responds with three energy absorptions, and heals two off of your one damage attack. Good job, idiot. Um, he put in Prism of Seven because Fatality is a thing. If he loses a one, he's never going to be able to pog out. So against something like my deck, where I might Koenmas early for two copies of his ones to go into the RFG, um, hopefully he's in game two where he has two copies of this Prism of, of Seven added into the deck, or he gets a third copy of it. So he can, he can if he gets all the Prisms out, he can, he can still get those ones back. Which is a great call. Um, um, and it's definitely saved him in some situations. Like, I'm sure against the Ken, who was also running Fatality, he might have lost a win. Anyone just grabbed it anyway. Um, Innocent Breeze helps. Uh, just in regular situations, you want to be able to prevent a person from getting momentum. You maybe want to flip uh, Dark Kirito, uh, which is why it's a two of in this deck. Um, uh, that, that card is pretty bad for this matchup because he's trying to rely on DR instead of raw blocking because he's trying to be very greedy and play out his hands every single turn. Um, so what do you do until when? Uh, Pure of Heart is something you're going to have to deal with. Everybody thinks about the stagger of this card, and the first E is just nuts. Um, he gets to do on both turns because he readies his staging area turn after turn. Um, you're just going to have to deal with one of your cards not being relevant on both turns. It's just very, very good. Um, if you have Anti-Throw, uh, good. You need multiple of it, again, because of Pure of Heart. Uh, I don't know. Jose always has Pure of Heart. It's crazy. But one Rhythmic is not enough. You need two Rhythmics and a Way of True Warrior and Demon uh, Realm Awakening in your hand. Because everything's a throw. Everything is a fucking throw. Um, if you don't have Throw Hate and you don't have some way to deal with wins, just go super hard with gigantic attacks. If you have big powerfuls, big multiples, something like that, go in. Um, it's very, it's very, very tough to go in with a string deck that's doing less than 10-ish damage. Like You need something that deals like 20 to his face right now um, and pressure him early. Um, and in the late game, I'm pretty sure the only things that can contend with him in the late game are like Yoshimitsu, Cassandra, and I don't know. I think that's it. It's a tough deck. Um, the night before the event, I tossed some Shogun Princes at him as a joke and he was like, hey, this is a real thing. And apparently it was pretty good for him. I think it's a really neat sideboard for, you know, playing against super aggressive decks that are trying to do what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, it's a cool deck. Just make sure that you pressure early. Pressure smart, right? Um, and uh, don't get tilted. Don't get tilted into this deck because it's very easy to get tilted. Um, because he, he can just, like, if he builds four foundations on turn one, he can play a Prism of Storm and pick up two wins and then ready his, stage, his board. It's very hard to backswing him because he just readies his entire board and he's ready for you, right? Um, so, so don't get tilted by it. Play smart, um, play around his, his stuff and just, just kill him with a giant attack because everything comes in for 30 these days. What's the next one? Cervantes. So this is Jason who is, uh, he's been a staple in, in Florida for a long time. Um, very, very nice guy. Very, very nice dude. I'm glad that he, he got results at this tournament. There's one thing I will say, though, Jason. This deck is super unoptimized. I was looking at it, and your numbers in it are a little bit wonky. Um, for starters, I would have played, like, four stakeout main. These are in the sideboard, and this is one of the best cards in your deck. Same with Guildseeker. I think those two cards alone just say you destroy a foundation. He pressures your, your staging area kind of like Raptor um, in that... He just keeps enhancing, right? He keeps enhancing. He's either getting momentum or you're destroying a foundation every single time. Um, and if the opponent has no way to deal with Biles Lunge, like this gigantic, powerful th four throw, then they're going to be destroying foundations. So you may as well be, just be just be going in. Um, but, you know, it worked out for him. He, he, top, he top aided very comfortably. 
Um, he's got three bang, uh, two power of the abyss, one Tagura Brothers, which I I will say, and I'm gonna keep saying this throughout throughout the day, or throughout this this talk. Um, I think Tagura Brothers is either a one of or a four of. Anything in between, um, or zero, of course. You know, like I just wouldn't play it. Like I think I think that that card is overvalued at this point, unless your deck is just built around pressuring their their board. Um, so something like Raptor or like this deck. I think that uh, that Slay Ride still is a little funky. Um, he definitely sacked into it a few times. Oh, you know what? I know what was happening. He was adding it to his momentum with his face. But this is a little bit awkward because this is a this is a you know it only chains chaos with you and not every, most of the cards don't have chaos. It's definitely a good block, but like he's just doing cheeky things with it and adding it to his momentum from hand. Um, it's interesting, but I wouldn't run four of it. Uh, TK Mastery. I think this is a card that people forget about. Just a very nasty card. Um, Match made in hell. I think this would. This is a card that I don't like. Um, the deadlock is definitely good, but the enhance isn't great. It's just like hunt, and you could just be playing hunt instead. Uh, shell is a good one. Things to, to to think about when you're playing against a deck like this, or just Cervantes, is he plays a different sort of UFS. Um, it's uh got tons and tons of keyword denial which is very cool um between things like his face getting rid of one of your keywords for free so you don't have combo sucks to suck you know you don't have stun you don't have powerful or ex or whatever you might need in that situation um uh he also backs it up with things like shell of a proud man and a shrine of nirvana and demon hide right demon hide is an ass beat in this deck because you're like oh well, i can just add keywords onto my attack nope i had this one five with an incredible high block um matches hunt but it stops him from black bearing the card back that's fair but he doesn't have any hunt and hunt is also very good for this for for what is essentially a very aggressive uh deck um but I mean that's worth saying. If you're worried about my, about Yoshimitsu and stuff like that, Matchman in Hell is a very good card because Yoshi definitely goes into deadlock. Um, and this is like flip, but it doesn't let them bl blink the card back in with Black Bear. So that's worth that's worth noting. Um, he's got serving the outworld in, in the sideboard, by the way, for Yoshimitsu because the boys are all afraid of my Yoshimitsu deck, and they think that that denying one Manji is going to be important. It's not. It's not, guys. I don't care. <laughs> um, uh. Hunt reverse, yeah, Hunt reversal is really fucked up. Uh, one thing to note is that Biles Lunge does not have Fury, so you cannot pick it up with Undying Rage. <laughs> um, but how do we play against this deck? You need Throw Hate. You need Throw Hate for Biles Lunge and Guilt Seeker, because those guards are fucked up. Those guards are super, super screwed up in this deck. Um, if you don't have the Throw Hate and you rely on, on like Powerful or some other keyword, boy, howdy, have a nice day. It's going to be tough. Um, you just got to poke him down. He's a 720. Um... So you can poke him down and you can hit him, but your your attacks are going to be tough. You know he's going to get rid of multiple. He's going to get rid of powerful. He's going to get rid of EX, um, and he's going to try to reversal Biles lend you, uh, and it's going to be big. Um, uh, it definitely preys on this format that has a lot, a lot, a lot of keywords in it, which is really cool. We like that. Um, I would recommend if I were to play, if I were to play this deck, I'd play four main board Kieran Soul. There's too too many throws in the format. Uh, I think Demon Hide was nuts, um, especially in this. Uh, in this thing, like, like, well, what, what do we do when they gain keywords? Oh my God, Demon Hide. It makes so much sense. I don't usually like that card because it's so niche, but this deck preys upon the keyword thing, right? So you may as well shore it up by having more Demon Hides. I think Sing for me is trash, and I would never play that card. Don't play that card. Stop it. Just stop. Like, I don't know. Seems kind of bad. I mean, like, I understand the logic, right? You're like, I. Don't like this card in my hand, so I enhance it to Cervantes, and they let me get it. But I didn't want that card. I wanted to make it into something else. So you sing for me? I don't know. I wouldn't play free copies, though. Uh, I don't know. Eh, maybe you can sell me on it. I'm not big on it. Uh, Dragon's Tongue, very good for board wipe. Sometimes you need that. Swordfish, great card. Guardian's Final Duty is pretty good in this deck because he's always got momentum. His gift, same thing. Fueling up, important. Just done all in all. It's it's. This is a good deck. I think that it could be improved by buffing by playing stakeouts meme by playing just four guilt seeker because that card's crazy i think sangue art sacrificale is crazy in this character because has four keywords and it gets rid of the best for foundation and gets you more momentum like just an ass beating um but he you know he beat me game one off of demon by the way 
Um, and it was, uh, it was really, really cool. Um, I had to, I had to really fight back to get to, to, to get to a tie because I was controlling the first game and I thought I was just going to slap him and he, he really gotcha my ass with a demon hide plus this double TK stuff. It was really cool. Sync for me could be more shell. That's true. More shell could be good. But yeah, that's Interventi's deck. It's just cool. Um, and sometimes it catches, it catches a format. Like if you show up to a tournament and everyone's relying on big multiples or big powerful attacks like he can just pound your butthole in uh let me go on to ricky's akuma which is the fourth place deck um this is a deck i made almost three years ago a very long time ago um he was not playing for shell um so people who play akuma are all doing one of two things. They either want to play gigantic attacks or they want to control. Um, if you're someone like, uh, I think that Akuma does both of those things really well. He is actually a control character, which is wild to me because the way that everybody plays him is so aggressive. Um, but they weren't going aggressive enough in my opinion. I, I saw the character and I immediately shoved in so this ways after release. I was like, this is too nuts to not play. He interacts in such a broken way with, with multiples. Um, and then shortly after, I was like, no, nah, we may as well just go Coffee Samba. Um, and we just play just man mode deck checks, right? Play a bunch of ones and twos and a whole fuck ton of foundations that don't do anything because the only two that we care about are Mission Fees and Enlightened by the Feet. And if we don't see those turn one, we mulligan. That is the deck. That's the entire deck. It's just Emission Fees, Enlightened by the Feet, and Sack Out on, on Attacks. And it's remained the exact same thing with some very minor changes since like three years ago when we built the deck almost three years ago uh when we built the deck for the first time um and so i played it in atlanta the atlanta ptc two years ago i got diversified by ben shoemaker um i lost in the the head-to-head -head dim it was a very funny match but it just wasn't my thing because i felt like i didn't have enough input on it it's definitely not like a like a skill expressive deck because it's just like you pog out or you don't but someone like Ricky can make it into a skill expressive deck because he's so good at playing aggro. He, you know, um, and uh, so so Ricky's an incredible player. Uh, he took the deck and he ran with it, and he's he's been improving it ever since with tiny tiny adjustments, you know, here and there, you know, stuff like stop. I didn't play it initially. Um, he added in the reductions, which which is actually kind of crazy for this deck. Um, he's playing things like uh, New Empress of, of uh, Nether Realm. I think he was playing. Uh, Emission Fees definitely makes this makes Akuma Akuma. I don't know. That's that's the grease. Um, but the damage potential of the deck is just ridiculous. Um, we were doing the math at the Atlanta PTC way back when. And it was like 100 damage if he draws the right stuff. He does like Sadistic Waves into Kapi Samba, into Dohatsu, into K Kongo, and checks well. It's broken. Deck is, deck is still, like, I think, bannable. I still think Akuma is bannable, even after all these years. And if you go back into the Unfun Stuff YouTube, one of the first videos ever made was me talking about going to the Atlanta PTC and saying, I would love to play Faye, I would love to play Takeda, but I think Akuma is just the most broken thing, and I want to show people why he's broken. And then I got diversified, so maybe I'm wrong. I still, I still really have mixed feelings about Akuma because I think that this specific build is so degenerate but the things he can do with the control end are, are very cool. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's just a very, very strong deck. Um, when I played against it in top eight, um, I knew it was going to be volatile because Akuma can just kill anything. Like, there's nothing that Akuma cannot kill. It's just a matter of, do you did you draw enough defensive things? And did the Akuma draw enough attacks to get past your defensive things? Um, so, you know, and, and uh, in, in our game one... Uh, I was doing Yoshimitsu things, and I got rid of three of his coffee sambas, and I was like, oh, I'm safe. Uh, so I just drew nine cards. I was just being Yoshimitsu, and I, was, I had nine cards in his hand, and then he played a coffee samba. I had no way for it, to, no way to, to, to cancel it. He, he, he blew up my Soul Calibur with the Tagura Brothers, and I was like, oh, I'm just dead because he stun 13 to me. Uh, so sometimes he died of that. Second game, I controlled the board. Third game, I, I uh, he sculpted for a long time, and I just couldn't find my Manjis. Uh, until the second cycle or something like that uh and uh and he had a great turn like I, I was there was a there was like getting close to time getting called um 
And so I was assembling my win con. I was just assembling like because he had some face downs. I was poking him to to I was poking with fatalities to make him flip his orphan alchemist and it was working. So I knew that I could get a reduction into from science string, but I needed him to expend some resources because you're going into my turn with five cards in his hand, and that was going to be a little too much for me to get past very easily. So I wanted him to get a guaranteed kill. So I sculpted up like six attacks um, with multiple from sciences, and uh, and then I went. To, I was like, okay, I'm going to survive this one turn. And um, because my hand was full of attacks, my blocks were not good. And I checked very poorly on my blocks, and uh, and he killed me. It was very cool. Um, Ricky played really well. Uh, congrats to him on the top four. Um, I was sad when he when he died to Miles because I just trounced Miles in our matchup. But it is what it is, man. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. Um, so what do you do against Akuma? Uh, you need to disrespect his defense early. Just play attacks, dude. Just play attacks. Sometimes he can't block. Um... And he definitely praises on the format's defenses being very card poor reliant. He loves water decks. Like, you block with a precise blow, he's like, yeah, dude, do it. Respond. Add a face down to my card pool. Do it. Play a play Royal Bodyguard, you know? Um, uh, but it struggles with some things. Like, Soul Calibur is tough for the deck to get around. Do not put him in Desperation, or else he has, he has, des he has you know, Desperation 2, Kafusamas, and Desperation 3, Dohatsus, and then he just walks all over you. Um, walking into fade is something you shouldn't do. Uh, if you have good defense, the best defense that you can get are several good mid blocks, and they have to be foundations. Uh, unfortunately, most of the mid blocks in the game are three pluses, so good luck. But if you have them, you know, send them in. Send them in. Uh, uh, it's pretty pretty good. You had United in the Cosmos for Janet. Ah, oh, that's what it was for. I couldn't figure it out. I, I thought you were just fucking trolling, dude. But yeah, that's the Akuma deck. His sideboard was literally just for Hellgate because he hates Kuwabara, I think. <laughs> which which is fair. Akuma doesn't get to play against Kuwabara, but he also has a stop and the good and evils. Like, there's ways to play around it. Um, but yeah, playing against the Akuma is just... Sometimes you're going to lose. I mean, it's just a thing. Against this deck, sometimes you lose because the high roll just kills anything. I mean anything. It doesn't matter how many revokes you have in your hand. doesn't matter how degrees you earn in, in your hand. doesn't matter how many cancels you have on stage, how many Soul Calibers. Sometimes you just die against this deck because it pogged out. Um, and you have to accept that. And just like... The thing is, though, that it's... it's it's High roll is very low percentage. You know, like drawing multiple Coffee Sambas after Citadel Ways and having Congo and having Dohatsu is not normal. So... You know, if he does pog out and kill you one game, that doesn't mean he's just going to walk all over you the other two games. So just, you know, play smart. Don't get tilted. Uh, and and play around the Akuma response. Let If you can, you know, defend from a swing. If you can cancel important enhances. The backswing is pretty easy, honestly. But, yep. That's Akuma. Whew. We are blazing through these, boys. Then we have Kuwabara. So this is really funny. In top eight... We had the the stand battle between Jose and I because Kevin Shelton was was apparently asking Jose for advice and like what deck to play and he took Jose's deck and made changes to it and then Andrew took my deck my Jan my Janet deck and made some changes to it so they were both playing with with a Bromley or Jose deck I technically had three decks in that in that top cut dude by the way pretty good deck builder over here and then jose also had you know our our, uh, our cool bar that we've been we've been on and off of for the past year um that he he's been he's been doing really well with you know like like after i think the second retro event we both went home and built a cool bar and then and then we like compared notes and i was like nah this is your deck jose um because uh, he was he was better at it and he had a better build um but kevin kevin was working with jose um he made some changes to the deck and did really well with it I mean, like showing up, both Andrew and 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 uh, Kevin. Um, it's uh, so that's an interesting thing to say, Kevin, because like when Ricky said he was he was gonna play the same Akuma deck they've been playing for two years now, I was afraid he wasn't gonna top because I think that deck has a tough time into things like Cassandra. Um, I think it, I think that it is a very volatile matchup in Yoshi. I think most of the time, uh, Yoshi will take that. Um, but again, sometimes it just kills you, but, um, never discount bad check Akuma's ability to just pog out. Um, it's just a thing that happens sometimes. I think it's a broken fucking deck, but it is very RNG reliant. You have to have gigantic cojones to play that deck in a tournament because sometimes you're not going to have the RNG on your time, but 
Yeah. Um. Oh, you just had one. So you had to change some foundations. Dude, that's that's you definitely should have messaged us. Now, okay. Now, me saying that Kevin was playing one of Jose's decks and Andrew was playing one of my decks is not me discounting. Like, no, these guys took them and made them their own, right? Just because they were originally like a, a you know an unfun stuff special doesn't mean that these guys weren't fucking like incredible deck builders in their own right. Like, most of my ideas are not my original ideas. I just go and I make them better. Like my Yoshimitsu deck is really just me working off of. Kevin Berber's idea and expounding on it, um, and and having good results with it. These guys did the same thing, so so I was really I was really I was just like like yeah, that's our deck, you know, that's really cool. Um, but let's talk about Kuwabara. He's actually the greediest five hander in the entire game. His face does all the work. His face does all of the work. So I gotta say, this card being one of in this deck is so nuts to be. I play three of it main board because I'm so afraid of like sambas and stops. I cannot handle someone stopping me when I play Kuwabara. Um, I mean, I guess you have PTP, but sometimes you don't have momentum, dude. Like, I think Celestial Being is just like, full stop. Don't touch my face. Get out of here. Um, Pure Heart is another insane card. You should just be running four of it. I understand you being a five-hander. You're just like, my imp only important card is Generous Gambler because that kills people. And you're right. Generous Gambler kills people. But there are some cards in this deck that I think are kind of superfluous like this searching of the nightmare i think does nothing for you i think hockey talk is greedy i think that manifestation is kind of greedy um you should have been running four of ageless and wise that card's insane and has a two low block syndicate target should not be in this deck i don't know what you're doing <laughs> no i'm just kidding I, I mean, people have different 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 abilities. I mean, these are things that I would do differently, but you have your own way of playing it. That's all right. The attack lineup is choice. It's prime Kuwabara to me because Kuwabara, the, the spice of his, his deck is how versatile he gets to make his attack lineup because he loops things so well. So, like, I, I might have, like, Deep Freeze in my deck. I might have, like, a copy of Exploding Flame Roar or more Swimming Birds, something like that. But it doesn't matter. The effect is still the same. One Rose Whip can become three Rose Whips in Kuwabara. Same with, like, you know, a, a Forbidden Moon set. Um, so that's why he can use these one of attacks really, really effectively. So it's very, very cool. Um, uh, but what are you doing to Kuwabara? He's nuts, right? Uh, if you have easy answers, like Overly Dramatic and Dark Kirito and Stop, make sure to use them in the right situation. I'm not going to stop a Kuwabara unless I'm about to backswing them, right? Just hold that stop. You know, if you don't have the cards to, to, to go after and you stop him and then you just build for, like, no, you don't do that. Same with Chirido. You're not just going to poke with a Chirido. You play Chirido into what kills the Kuwabara. You don't re respond overly dramatic on something that was just going to reduce the damage by four. You reduce the damage on the one that was going to kill him. So you just got to use your your cancels for his response, which are very wide. There's tons of them. Um, is just, hey, you know, I got to use these in the right situations. Um... If you are playing into Kuwabara with a fair deck, which you should not be doing in today's UFS, there's too many unfair broken decks, poke him to 17 or 18, where he's just outside of Desperation, and then swing. Because if you poke Kuwabara into Desperation, like comfortably into Desperation, where he's at like 15-ish, oh man, you're dead. You are just dead. He's going to play 8 attacks, and he's going to kill you. Um, also, Cyborg Cosmos, I don't understand this. I just don't get it. <laughs> I don't know how you died to the Janet. You were only taking 12, dude. This is actually nutty for you. <laughs> um, but I understand the Alier League. That's really that's really good. I like that you added the more attacks. This is like a very... This is a very me sort of style where I'm like, I want more Moon Sits for this matchup. I want more Reverberate for this matchup. I want more Rosewood for this matchup. That's really cool. Very cool. Um, all in all, very sweet build. Um, I definitely, I definitely would change some things if it were my own, but like you had the results, did a great job. Kudos, very, very well done. Um, and if you want to beat Kuwabara, play an unfair deck, playing one of those three important cancels for Kuwabara slash funky tomato for Kuwabara. Uh, oh, I guess that would work. So he would play noob, respond noob. Respond, region you respond funky tomato, so he can't modify it anymore. Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's a neat way to do it. That's a cool call. And funky tomato flexes defensively very well too. Um, hmm, that's cool. 
Very neat. All right. But that's this is a sweet deck. I like the inclusion of the uh, Slay Ride. I definitely would have played more copies of Sea Salika because I think that card's crazy in Kuwabara in conjunction with Generous Gambler. These greedy six diffs and five diffs and stuff like that just become so unblockable. They're so fast. Um, but pretty cool, pretty cool. I didn't even hit that that part of the, the, the funky meal. I love when local metas have things that are like just, this is for my boy, right? Like like Jason coming up with, with serving uh, the Outworld. Uh, I had Demon Realm Awakenings for Jose. I mean, I, I actually put it in for Cassandra, but it worked against Jose too. And then you guys were like, nah, I need to beat my boy in top eight. So I have Reunite of the Cosmos, and he had uh, he had uh, uh, Funky Tomato. That's really cool. I love that. And there's definitely that stuff happening with uh, with Miles and Shane as well, which we'll get to in a sec here. Uh, that was third. So then we've got uh, Ken's Miles, which if you've played UFS over the past uh, two years, you've seen this deck. What do you do into Ken 2? It just wants to pog out, guys. If you see the attack lineup, you see how it's all four ofs, dude. Oh, I have to put this up a little bit. Dude. This is a one of, and this is a four. It's all four ofs because because Ken wants to draw. So all the attacks are four ofs because we're trying to maximize the, the, the ability to get them into the discard pile or into the RG pile. Um... So I think there's two ways to play into Ken. And I played a lot into Ken. We've got Ricky who played Ken for a very long time. I played into Phil playing Ken a long time. I've played Miles twice in two different big tournaments. Uh, you have to decide how you're going to deal with him. The first way to deal with him is that his defense, although I, I will go into later how Miles' his entire board is defense, his defense is kind of lackluster. So if you, can, if you go first, you can just kill him. Um, if he goes second, you must be able to survive the turn two via disruption, intelligent blocking, which I'll go into later, or, you know, uh, uh, just being able to tank the certain, the right things. Um, the big thing is that if you're playing a seven hander into Kent, you must be prepared to just go to like two and then backswing him. Um, and you have to block the right things. Uh, uh, his attacks are very frequently coming in for like nine they're coming in for seven and then it comes for 30 and you need to be able to take the nine and take the seven so that you can not take 30 on the third and fourth attacks you don't block inazuma even if it's coming for 10 you don't block the violent shuriken if he doesn't get the pog out on the ken even if it's coming for 12 because you're not dead yet you're gonna die to the kurubushi kick you're not gonna die to the violent shuriken you're not gonna die to the shuriken you're dying to the kurubushi kick you're dying to the fourth copy of of a firefly gunner that 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 is coming in for 14 or something like that. So you block intelligently against Ken. It doesn't let him poke if he needs to, dude. That's fine. If Ken pokes and you get to turn three or four, you already won that game because his board is not going to be defensive. It's defensive enough to block for me or to survive a turn two swing out. It is not defensive enough to, to be able to defend against a full string. It's just not going to work. Um, so d block intelligently um, and make sure you've got the right answers to the right things. Uh, uh, his defense is actually pretty interesting. Uh, like I was saying, Miles, Miles says my face does all the all the offensive work. So apart from like I feel violent and maybe Shallon Fighter, which is actually a defensive card as well, um, everything is like defense. He doesn't want to get banged, so he plays four cores victory pose and two copies of Dark Side of Karma. Um, I don't know what No Surprises is doing in this deck, honestly. I think it's just a 0-6, but I don't think anybody should play, be playing that card. And it's not just because I played Takeda. It, there just must be something locally that he's been worried about. Um, he plays Servant Aries to answer things on your board. Um, he's not playing throws. It's literally just there to, to try to flip something important, maybe like a Sense of Morals or something like that. Uh, yeah, it, it's just it's just all in on, like, I'm going to block one thing, and that's going to be the one thing that was important, and then I'll backswing. Or, or after I've swung out, you know, like, like it's just trying to survive one of your turns. Um, and that's what, that's what his board does. Uh, an interesting note is that he's definitely playing three banished and broken because he was tired of dealing with Raptor. And guess who was playing Raptor? Because otherwise you would never play this card. <laughs> you would never play this card in a million years. I've never seen it in anybody's stuff. I think this card is absolute ass. It's just that Fire Symbol doesn't have any, anything apart from like Shokin Prince that's, that's interacting with raptor and says you can't destroy this so this this does that i guess and that's what i was talking about like everybody has stuff for their local guy so he was prepping for for shane's raptor by putting in these uh these banished and broken and of course out of your leaks um 
An important thing to note, speaking of the outer leaks, is in the second and third game, don't rely on your responses. Um, <laughs> it's your tech friend. Uh, uh, out of your league is something you have to think of for the second and third games, um, which you almost always have, will have against Ken because the games go so fast, unless you're trying to mill him, which is what I love to do against against Ken, <laughs> you know, is just try to mill them out. Um, and uh, just got to... Just gotta be be aware of it. Be aware that it's a thing because he draws so many fucking cards. Um, this is another broken deck that just skates under the radar because only one guy plays him. Um, but like Ken is such cancer for the for like the game. I think um, most of these Dark Stalkers characters are just so fucking cracked. They do so much work with just their face. Yeah, that is a quote. I did tell Miles I paid for sixty minutes. I'm gonna get my sixty minutes, and I did try to mill him out. But he had the one copy of Inhuman Speed, and that was preventing me from healing back to full with my uh, Manjis. Um, but uh, uh, it's a very cool deck. There's definitely a hundred different ways to play Ken because he's so versatile. All that matters is you're playing a four difficulty or higher attack, so you can play the weapons package. You can play this kick package. Um, you can play all sorts of things. Like it's so, it's he's he's a very versatile, incredibly ver uh, uh, nutty character. Uh, if he if he pogs out with Yin Yangs, you probably are just dead though. So just you know, so it's the same thing as like Akuma, where just sometimes you're gonna die. Um, but if you can, don't block early. The early stuff's coming in for nine. It's coming in for ten. It's coming in for seven. We don't care about that. That doesn't kill me. The Kuribushi kick kills me. Block the Kuribushi kick. Whew. But yeah, that's this deck. Um, and I think that if Miles had played in the final, I think he would have wiped the floor with Shane um, just because of the differences in their deck. Shane's Raptor was doing a very different thing, um, and this Ken was prepared for that. Uh, he didn't, you know, this, this deck didn't really care about the breaker because of all the readying and things like that. And when they played head to head in singles, um, the uh, I think that Miles won the matchup. Um, so yeah. It's, there's not much to add to the conversation, right, to this one. I think that Miles has brought this specific package of Ken stuff to probably the Zenith. Um, uh, and you just got to play intelligently against it, and, and you can beat it. You know, even though Miles is a very, very, very good player, you can beat it. It's definitely exploitable. Um, it's just, it really preys upon uh, bad play, I think. It preys pays upon bad play, and it preys upon, like, people who aren't prepared for this level of, of, of aggression. Um, then the final deck is Shane's Raptor, which is probably the uh, <laughs> the greediest way I've ever seen Raptor played, in a different way than normal. So um, when I saw the list, I was really surprised, because he's not playing, he's only playing one shotgun, so it's nothing like Barrett's deck. Um, he's playing three Azunas, he's playing two Sweets, the four hurricanes is what really got me. And um, then I saw the way he played and I understood it. Um, this deck is made to kill five-handers. Exclusively. Kill five-handers. And I'm surprised he didn't die to more seven-handers. Because it pokes very effectively. Um, because it's debuilding you two when it pokes with the hurricane of death. But it has to commit two foundations or more in order to poke with the Hurricane of Death, because it's a five difficulty and there's no six checks in this deck, right? So he's tapping at least one and the Friends and Rivals so that he can respond with his face and Hurricane of Death, right? So like the typical string that Raptor usually plays where he's going like Stinging Skull, Leg Shredder, Leg Shredder, Stinging Skull or something like that, um, doesn't work very well here because he's only playing two heal by a Shaman. He can't go chase more of them. Um, and his, his foundation base is like, is like, so laser focused on getting a good build so that I can Hurricane of Death poke first uh, on the second turn. It's very, very good into five-handers. Um, but I think I think that if if he encountered like a more defensive seven-hander like Cassandra, I think he would have had problems. Uh, same with like if he played into my Yoshimitsu deck, I think he would have had problems because if you play into a deck like this that's relying pretty hard on controlling your, your board... Um, He's going to get caught with Tuguros in his hands if you're not using your board, you know? Um, you just got to get the sheer number of foundations. He's killing two every turn, so you build four, and you hold two low blocks. And you don't care about the, the leg shredder poke. Whatever, dude. You'll take six, and you'll build to ten foundations, and you'll build to 14 foundations, because all his deadlock is showtime, you know? That's all he has. And once you're ready, and you're like, I don't care about your breaker anymore, then you can just kill him. 
um, it's not hard to to push past uh, a Raptors board state when all of his defense is just on poking. You know, he's not playing. Um, feels good to be bad. He's he's got conquest of terrors, which is which is good, but not great. Um, you know, there's no there's no speed resets in this deck. He's just saying I'm gonna set your board. Like his speed reset is the dark side of karma in the sideboard, right? But but like if you go first and you build five on your turn first turn, you build four on your next turn. Like you're sitting pretty. Uh, I just wouldn't poke against this deck. Like I, and I don't do that against Raptor either. I spend three turns building against Raptor exclusively every single time. It's like playing against Jetta. You don't want to get caught with your pants down. You know, because if you poke with a five difficulty and had to tap two foundations, then he breaker twos you and you check a three to play to play your two difficulty foundation. That's actually a five diff now. You're never coming back in that game. So just build, just build and don't play your foundation enhances. Don't play your foundation responses against them because the Tiguros are going to get stuck in their hand. And now they got minus one or minus two hand size. Um, so I definitely think this deck is very beatable. Um, I think that it's 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 definitely cool, but I think it does one thing. And if you just adjust your gameplay to, to beat that one thing, you can definitely play against it. Um, if you're a low-hander, you know, disrespect his ability to, to string you because that's not what this deck is doing. It's just poking. Um, and build four and hold a low block, you know? Block the stinging skull. If you're a high-hander, again, disrespect his, his, his offense and build four and hold two low blocks, you know? Um, if he's destroying two every turn, you build three. If he's, he, you know, if he's throwing one every turn, you build four, and you just outbuild his ability to to debuild you, and you will go far. And it's just like Jetta. Don't use your abilities on your foundations, or else you will walk into Tagura Brothers. You know, you might be sitting there with your Aegis and Wise and stuff like that. If I like, here's a, if I'm playing Kuabara into this deck, for instance, and I have Aegis and Wises out, the Raptor is not going to respond unless he has double Tagura in his hand, and he's trying to debuild me four. So what do I do? I just throw one of my foundations. I'm going to hold my Ageless and Wise. And he's going to be like, oh, I got these two useless blue cards in my hand. You know? So just, like, play well. You know? Play smart. Think about what your opponent has available to them and adjust. Um, yeah. I, so so that's, that's, it's definitely a very, very, very dope deck. I'm not saying that Shane, like, like Shane won, right? Um, but it, like, and Shane's an incredible player, but he was doing one thing, and I think that it's an exploitable strategy in the same way that he's exploiting five handers who are, who are building really, really greedy, uh, builds, you know, that are just like, oh, well, you know, maybe I got caught into a hand of attacks or seven handers who are just trying to poke into the Raptor. Don't poke the Raptor. Don't poke the Raptor. Assemble your string and kill him later. You know, he said it himself. He's waiting until turn four, man. He's poking you once every turn. Hold that low block on block it, dude. Block that little that block that stinging scroll. Block the hurricane of death, you know. And if and if and if you block the hurricane of death and you tapped out and he's like, oh shit, I got I can play leg shredder into into something like that. He's only got one spirit shotgun in, in the list, and odds are it's not killing you. So you can like I was saying, disrespect the offense, or in, or in this case, intelligently play around the offense that's just poking. And you know it's kind of like the opposite of the Ken. The Ken is a string dead that caps off at the with the fourth attack that's coming in for 30. So you have to not block early against this deck. I would block early and build block early, build block early, build. Um, yeah, that's what I think. And probably in the second and third games, if you're playing that way, he's going to sideboard out his to brothers and put in a bunch of these like bangs and dark set of karmas in the shell of a man. And you've won at that point. Now you can actually use your ages and wises and things like that. So that's what I think. But yeah, so the event was super, super successful. It was super fun. Um, there are a lot of really, really neat decks. Uh, a lot of neat people that that showed up and played. Um, and and uh, like people are gonna say, oh, the format's stale. Formats, you know, there's there's not that many new cards. And like, if you look at the top eight, you know, your top four had three Star Street Fighter versus Doc Starkers characters, right? And that's kind of lame, but. The rest of the top eight had really cool stuff. You know, we had a really interesting... Yeah, nobody playing Andy. There's a lot of stuff in the format that's really, really good. Uh, Cassandra's didn't show up, and Cassandra's 100% the best deck in the format. Um, I just think that the deck is also incredibly hard. Um, and and so, you know, the 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 some of the list might not have been optimized. You know, like, I know the list that we built for Josh was not optimized. We were missing a few cards, um, but, you know, he, he, he did he did as well as he could. Um, and And so, you know... 
uh, it's not a stale format, even with like there being fewer cards. Uh, you know, I haven't seen a Raptor deck like this. You know, I haven't seen anybody really digging in and seeing what that Janet, that noob Janet deck looks like in a tournament sense. You know, like I built it just for fun, and I was like, maybe this could be cool. I think it's one of the better decks in the format. Um, but I just never put the time into it. So it's cool to see somebody that did that with it. Um, Yoshimitsu's got a hundred different builds. Janet has a hundred different builds. I have tons of Janet decks that are super, super, super uh, aggressive and very, very good. Um, Takeda's really, really good. Cowboy Andy's really good. The, 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 the format is wide open because of the number of cards in it. And all you've got to do is go out and, you know, say, well, let's see what worked in this format that we saw at the South Town Summer Showdown, right? And it's like, well, poke decks did well. String decks did well. Combo decks did well. Like, dude gigantic throw decks did well there's tons and tons of versatile very different kinds of of stuff going on you know we saw a void deck and an air deck in top eight at basically a ptc and people have been shitting on those symbols for two and a half years you know like that's incredible that's awesome um it's not just water decks it's not just reverberate decks it's not just cassandra um really really cool stuff um, yeah, I definitely was surprised that there weren't any Andes. I think that Andy is crazy, but, um, Andy is very similar to Ken, in my opinion. I think he's a better version of Ken in that they're just blisteringly fast, super gigantor attacks. Uh, just that Andy, Andy has, has such a huge build that he can, he can, he can really go deep, you know, like he's playing five diffs instead of four diffs and, you know, five diffs kill you. Shotgun's pretty good, as it turns out. So, yeah, I was surprised not to see any Andes, but I'm sure we'll see it next time. But um, but for everybody on my YouTube channel, thanks for uh, checking out the video. Hope you learned some. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you disagree with me. Let me know in the comments where, where I went wrong. Um, and we'll see you next time on the Brewing with Phil. Sorry, Brewing with Birch and Bromley podcast. Um, yeah.